Hi there. Welcome to Cocktails and Conversation. I'm Samantha Hoffman. I'm the VP of the Chicago Writers Association and the Executive Director of Let's Just Write an Uncommon Writers Conference. And we're so happy that you're joining us today. If you haven't tuned in before, this is a series where we chat with people who've been presenters at our previous conferences and who will be presenting again when we resume for our in-person, in-person, I'm so excited, event on March 20, 19th and 20th, 2022. So exactly a year from now. Yay. And you can find out more information about it on our website, um, chicagorights.org. And Kristen will be there. So this is just gonna give you a little preview of her session. So first of all, I'm going to own up to my ineptitude. This is not the original recording. When Kristen and I did this um, on March 7th, I, something happened with the recording. And so I wasn't able to post it on our YouTube channel and people who weren't able to attend the session live didn't get to see it. But, you know, it's such valuable information and Kristen is so charming and lovely. I just decided we needed to try to recreate it and so that you guys can see all the content. And there's probably even some bonus content because we're not gonna remember exactly how we did it the last time, but we'll try to cover all the important things and add some new stuff. And I don't have a cocktail, I have my Kristen's my hero. Two women here. Two women, yay, from New Glarus, yay. <laughs> I don't have it this time, I always do, but um, it's two o'clock in the afternoon. Yes. And, you know, it's five o'clock somewhere, obviously in uh, Madison. <laughs> right, it's always five o'clock in Madison. <laughs> so, but even I have my standards, although they're very low. So, you know, it's not inconceivable. I'll go get a beer or something during this. Event. So um, I'm going to introduce Kristen. Kristen is my friend and a former CWA board member. And as I said before, she's one of the presenters at our conference. Her debut novel, Carpe Diem, Illinois, won a 2014 Chicago Writers Association Book of the Year Award. It was a finalist in the Independent Author Network 2015 Book of the Year and a runner up in the 2016 Shelf Unbound Best Indie Book Competition. It's so cool. Its sequel, God on Mayhem Street, was released in August of 2016. Um, Kristen is excellent at doing research on her novels and she seems to enjoy that part of the writing process so much. So, that's what we're gonna talk about today. So we'll begin. Um, Chris and I read somewhere that you recommend saving your research for the second draft. So tell me how that works. Okay, so yeah, basically your first draft is, your goal is just to get it all down. Um, just your ideas, everything else. Uh, remember that this draft is just for you and you alone, nobody else is gonna read it. Um, it's just to get the story down and your goal is to get it finished, that first draft finished. If along the way- This is such an important point. Can we just veer off just a little bit sure. here and say, because I am a serial editor, it's really hard for me not to edit everything I write every time I look at it. But so much of what I edit during that process will get deleted anyway. So if you don't get the story down, you'll never finish it. Right. I'm, what I like to, what I like to say is you don't know how it's going to start until you finish it. So you may have that first chapter might be perfect because you've done it 30 times, but by the time you get to the end of the book, you just get rid of that whole first chapter. Um, spent 30 times editing right, it. Right. It, it's not wasted because you're developing your writing and everything else, but it, it, it's not good for, it doesn't help the story along and get that's it finished. True. Yeah. yeah. It, you know, we like to work on stuff that's already there. That's just easier to, <laughs> than to have to come up with new stuff and 
not know where the story's going and write ourselves in a hole or whatever, trying to get out of it. Um, so I understand all that, but yes, just get through the story, get it down. And research, by the way, is a great way of procrastinating. Yes. So we'll talk, <laughs> talk a little about exactly. that and why right. you do it. So what I do, and I do this in my first draft and chances are second and sometimes third drafts. If I come across a question I have, um, I don't, I'm not familiar with, like in my first book, they were walking through the, the um, town square and there was a gazebo and it was October in Illinois and the birds were flying around the gazebo and not being a birder, I didn't know which birds those would be in October in Illinois. So I thought, well, somebody is of course gonna know that if I put the wrong bird in. So, but instead of researching that, which might've taken me you know, a half hour or more, I just highlight it and make a little note. Um, if I know for sure it's going to take less than 10 minutes, I might just look it up real quick. But if it starts to take me longer, then highlight it and move on. Um, I think we talked about this last time too. The nice thing about that is if you are hitting writer's block and you just can't think of where the story's going, go back in your notes and see, oh, I have to research these things. Do that um, because that also might spark more ideas for your story, but also you're accomplishing something. Right. Those writer yeah. yeah yeah that's great advice yeah so what kinds of things do you research well pretty much anything and i, I suppose all of us on this or watching this uh, you know you're on the cia the fbi the homeland security lists because of all the stuff that we you know we research and what's actually kind of fun when we were talking about doing this um i wrote uh, my latest newsletter was about um, the different research, the current different research. And then I thought, well, this is something I haven't really written about. And then I went back in and realized this is like the fourth or fifth newsletter I've written about this. Um, and one, the first one was just for that day, I jotted down all the things I looked up on, on Google. Most of it was all Google stuff. And it was fascinating. It was like how to speak Italian. And you can, you know, all of this stuff you can find online if you don't know an Italian, which of course you'd want to know the Italian, that'd be the best source, but, but you can hear them do it over and over again. So Italian, but then lately it's been um, drones and pipe bombs and things like that, because I'm writing a dystopian story. Um, so, I mean, the variety is just, it's just amazing. And it's fun at the end of the day to just get that list and see where, where it's taken you. Yeah, yeah that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think, um, last time was her name, Mary Kay. She she offered to pay your bond when the FBI she came did. and confiscated <laughs> your, she did. your hard drive. <laughs> I'm very happy about that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I um, some years ago I was writing a um, a short story, and in this short story, one of the characters committed suicide. And it was right around the time when Anthony Bourdain and Kate Spade had both died by suicide and they both hanged themselves from a door. And so I found myself Googling, how do you hang yourself from a door? Because I could not figure out how that would happen. Right. I never ended up using it in my short story, but later I thought if there was someone out to get me, and they, and they wanted to do away with me, they could just come to my house and hang me from a door and everyone would think it was suicide because I had Googled how to do it. I know. I know. Oh my God. Oh yeah, there's so many people that, you know, might be a little afraid of the stuff I've been looking into. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. It is. So what are some of the most fun things you've researched? So, um, well, lately, it runs the gamut. Um, lately, it was uh, UV, actually, I have it right here, UV flashlights. Um, my editor, Tim Storm, who was on last time, right. he um, had said, I have a UV, my characters, without giving too much away, are in a enclosed, dark, it's completely dark space. And they know they have these flashlights they've been given. So they try to turn them on. And in my mind, in my perfect world, nothing would happen when it would go on. And it's important for that. Um, but he said, doesn't UV light actually shine a color? 
And so I, I had to do research on that. And I thought, well, that's an easy question. And I don't know if I, I don't know if you'll be able to see it. I don't know if I should bother turning it on, but you, yes, you can see it's a little purple. Yeah. So I did research and the UV light actually, it's UV light has no color spectrum by itself, but manufacturers of overhead lights and flashlights will add the coloring to them. And my characters would be using a flashlight. So it would have the color into it. Um, so that that's kind of a bummer for my story, but not hard to not hard to correct. Um, the other thing is they do, it does look up um, bodily fluids. So, you know, the whole thing with, I don't know, a couple of years ago, they did a, a scan of the different um, hotels and actually did the flash of light on the, yes, and found all kinds of interesting, because then I wondered, well, can it, can it spot blood? Can it see blood? Not blood, but it does do urine and semen. So yeah, so that was kind of interesting. I know. Well, they, it, some of this stuff though, I actually couldn't find online. Um, I wanted to see, so yes, it does show ultraviolet, but then I wanted to see how bright it was in the dark enclosed place and, it, and what else it would shine on and those things. Um, and I couldn't get that information from the internet. So I went ahead, bought the flashlight and I got the pins around here somewhere. Um, and we've been having all kinds of fun with those. And it wasn't I, expensive, you know. I hope you don't take those into hotel rooms with you. I know, I know, I know. Probably won't do that. Yes, no. no. Best, best not to know, right? No, best not to know. Yeah, so that was interesting. And then it's interesting because you get to a point where you just realize you have to do more than just Google searches. Um, so going back to the comment about when you do the research and maybe to avoid it during the first draft, there's a caveat to that. So if the research is gonna completely change your story, um, your storyline, then you wanna do that research upfront. So for instance, um, in the third book in the series I'm working on, my character escapes to the wilderness um, and he has to know survival skills. And so I thought, well, I can just go to the library and get a stack of books on that. And I'm a, a city girl, a Madison to me is small town. I don't cook camp at all, you know, just Girl Scouts when I was a kid kind of a thing. Um, so I really know nothing about survival, but I thought this stack of books will do it. Well, no, I realized I have to actually experience it. Um, and at the same time, it was really weird how this stuff kind of works, uh, the serendipitous um, events happen. I got a uh, magazine in the mail and it was a traveler magazine, which I had not ordered and my daughter hadn't ordered it. And I was paging through and there was a ad for Explore Chicks. So it's Explore Adventures just for women only. And I thought, well, that's, yeah, that's interesting. That's kind of fun. Serendipitous. I know. And then the ad, specific ad, now this takes, my story takes place in the mountains of Virginia. And the ad was, uh, survival school and hiking the Appalachian Trail in Virginia. And they had one in October and one in April. And this was in the summer, I think. So I thought, well, I'll wait till April. First of all, I kind of needed to get in the shape. And second of all, the weather was the same as what it would be in my book. So I went ahead and oh. did the survival school and actually learned a lot. It was pretty amazing. Met some amazing women and hiked the Appalachian Trail. So that was really important to, to, for me to understand the story. Um, also in this series, I had considered um, one of my characters to be deaf. She could be deaf and it would, it would hearing impaired. It would make sense to the story. Um, there'd be a reason why that would happen. But I, again, I don't, I don't know anybody personally very well who's hearing impaired. Um, nobody in my family has that, so I haven't been through that experience. Um, so Tim Storm's wife is an audiologist. So I called her up and I said, hey, can I meet with you? And so she did for an hour and a half and I picked her brain and I discovered that um, there would be, it would be more involved than my story. Um, you know, of course you'd have to know sign language and the other characters would have to be able to communicate with her through that means. And that's basically like learning a foreign language. It's a whole deal. Sure. And there's a really strong community. So I'd have to maybe develop a community in the book. And it was just beyond what my story was going to be about. And yeah. it was good. I did it at that point because I had started to write her in that way in what I assumed it would be like. And if I had spent 
you know, months or a year writing that character that way before I had done that kind of research, I would have wasted all that time because now, of course, she's not going to be that way. Right. One um, part of the um, your experience hiking the Appalachian Trail, did you use in the book? Do you remember? Well, so it's still, it's the third book in the series, which is, it's in its like third draft. So it's very rough right now, but um, I'm going to, I'm going to use a lot. I think we had one whole day. Uh, we, we hiked uh, four days. Oh, so this is a really interesting story. I have, I have the book here somewhere. So we, we were supposed to hike four days. Um, and I was the oldest woman there by not much, but there was a, you know, there was a group of like, there was a 20 something. And then there was like, four or five 30 somethings and then a couple 40 somethings and then us in the 50s a um, couple of us in the 50s um, and the first day we get there after I was the only one that flew that you know all the travel and everything else right away we did a three mile hike and so I'm, I'm a walker I figured you know I can I can handle that well you forget that it's really flat in the midwest even though <laughs> I have hills in my neighborhood that's not no 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 so we hiked the first day, the second, I did okay, I was pleased. The second day um, was all day in the survival school. So we were outside, we were learning to build fires in the rain. We were learning how to make uh, tents out of tarp and just uh, using the materials around us. Um, it was fascinating, it was really something. So I took a lot of notes, I did videos so I can remember all of this. Um, the woman that runs the school said she would review the manuscript for me. So when I get to that point, I'm going to send it to her to make sure. Um, yeah, we did that. Um, we hiked. So then the, the fast, her husband at the time um, that we were there, he also was, he had other groups. There was a lot of groups that were there at this school doing other hikes and everything else. And so he was kind of um, helping them out. And it was the second night, it was Saturday night. I also hadn't slept well and I was exhausted and I knew I couldn't do the hike. So I thought, I am just gonna stay back and relax. Um, when I first got there, I said to him in particular, I said, the problem with me doing the survival school is my character does not wanna be found and you're teaching people how to be found. Oh. So what do we, right? So what do I do? So he said, and I, if I have it on the shelf, I'll get it. I don't know if you care, but it might be right here. Anyway, he said, he pulls out this big book and it's U.S. Air Force or something, survival. It's a thick survival thing, which used to be top secret, but now, of course, you can get it on Amazon. So he plopped in front of me, he turned to the back, and there's all the ways to escape the enemy or to hide from the enemy. It was perfect. <laughs> so Saturday, I just took the book. I sat in that beautiful lodge. I sat in the lodge, and I'm reading it and taking notes. And I was reading some other book at the time, and I'm reading that. And he happened to be there because he was kind of hosting people and walking through. And, and so then one time when he had about an hour of a break, he sat down with me and we, I picked his brain because I found out that he is, and again, I'm going to forget the acronym, acronym for it. He, you know, you have the Navy SEALs, which are the top of, you know, of, of everybody in the armed forces. He trains them. So he's a, a top and there's only about 200 in the country. And here I am sitting with this man. It was unbelievable. And his job was to train them when they're captured. What do they do? That was his job. I was like, I can't believe this. Yeah. Yeah. So the whole thing worked out so well. Um, and, it, and if I'd gone on a hike, I would have missed that opportunity. You know, if I had gone at a different time or whatever. Um, I think the biggest takeaway from that is ask questions always, you know, just be open for questions. Right. And I, and I think we talked a little bit about that last time because I do teach this course on research and I had somebody say, but I'm shy, I'm introverted. It's hard for me to approach people. And I think the majority of writers are introverted. Um, so that is tough. So what you have to do is start out easy, slow, and maybe just an email is enough because you can get enough information from them. But then we had talked about, you find that people love, if, oh, hi, Bailey. <laughs> Bailey's a charter member of Cocktails yes. and Conversation. Yes, yeah. Um, people love to talk about what it is they'd like to do. 
So right. if you're approaching anybody, a police officer or anybody, it might be nerve wracking at first. Well, once you get the first few questions out, you'll find that it's really pretty easy. Yeah. 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 And people are fascinated with writers. I don't know if you've had that experience, Samantha, oh. but you're like, oh, a writer, you yeah. know, it's just an awe of that. So right. it's, it's good for your ego too. <laughs> it is. You know, this um, event came about because I had written a blog post about write what you don't know. Because, you know, there's that old adage that they tell writers, write what you know. Well, you know, that's fine the first time around, but then we're writers, we make things up. Right. So, and you're someone who creates worlds that don't exist. Um, so that's how the this came up in the first place. And you, uh, last time you talked about, your first book was about, was it about unschooling? Yes. Yeah. And so, so talk a little about that. Okay. Yeah. So I think that adage, write what you know, um, works for your first book in particular. Um, you, the most important is write what you love, especially for that first book, because you're going to find that it's going to take you, well, it take, took me six years, um, not full time that, you know, I was just trying to figure things out, but yeah, it's going to take you years. So you, you want to love the subject and chances are that's going to be something that you're really, really familiar with. Um, so my first book, Carpe Diem, Illinois, is about a small town that doesn't have any schools. They unschool their children, which is what I did with my children. So I'm, I was for many, many years a homeschool, still kind of am, um, advocate and, you know, did support groups and, um, wrote articles for home education magazine and things like that. So I wanted my ideal world would be a town that is completely unschooling, which means child led learning. Um, the children decide what they want to learn when they want to learn and uh, how they want to go about learning it. Um, so they're totally in control, control of their education. And yeah, and so I, that's, that's what I wrote about. And it was, I, the research was easy other than the birds in the you know gazebo, I, I knew everything about the, the subject. Right, right. The tricky part, of course, was to make it so I wasn't so biased one way versus the other, um, which is why I created the main character, Leo Townsend. He's a reporter, and so he's trying to figure out what this whole thing is. Yeah. Yeah. And so then your second novel, that's a whole new world, right? Right. So um as I go about learning how to write, um, and it's taken so long, um, as you're figuring this out, you realize that it's not about the book itself have, may have an issue. I like to write about big issues, but that's not the book. The book itself is the character. It's always about comes down to that main character. And it took me a while to realize that. Um, I think I knew that though, when I wrote the last sentence, here we go, last sentence of the first draft. I'm like, oh my gosh, Leo has more stories to tell. I didn't, I didn't originally think that, but then when that was over, I was like, oh yes, he's got more stories. So this, the second one is, um, he is in, in a lot of my books, we, I think we talked a little bit about places, which we can talk a little bit about that too. Yeah. Um, the first book takes place in Carpe, my imaginary town, Carpe Diem, Illinois, which is on the way, if you get people familiar with the Northwestern part of the state, it's on the way out to Galena um, on highway 20. And most of it takes place there. Some of it also takes place in Chicago. The second book takes place in my imaginary town of Endeavor, Wisconsin, um, and came to find out that there actually is an Endeavor, Wisconsin, which we can talk about too, um, but also Madison and Chicago. So he, Leo, is in Chicago on Michigan Avenue on um, Spaggio, Spaggio, Spaggio. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's there having lunch with the front running um the presidential candidate who is openly gay and of course we've had candidates that are openly gay that have run but this guy's going to win he's got a really really good chance of winning so it's a really important interview for leo and during right before they get started in the interview he gets a phone call from his brother that his father has suffered a near fatal heart attack and leo has to come to the family farm in endeavor wisconsin to help out so he misses out on the interview um, the candidate decides to come to the small town where the village president is homophobic and the villain of the town. So oh. that's where the conflict comes in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And so, and so why didn't you use a real town? Why did you make one up? So um, for a couple of reasons, um, if you, if, well, okay. So if you use a real town, you wanna to make sure that you don't put it in a bad light. Um, towns can't sue you for that. They can't, they can't, there's no way they can do that, but still, you wouldn't want if bad things happened there. So in my endeavor, the village president is the villain in the story. Um, there are some good people in the village, but also some bad people. Um, it makes you think of like Stephen King, his little town, Derry, Maine is always, there's horrific things happening in his towns, right? Stephen King. Um, so he never uses a real town either. Uh, and, and I just, I thought I was coming up with the name Endeavor, Wisconsin. I thought that's a really cool name for a town. And you didn't um, Google it or? No, because I had created that name. <laughs> well, so it's mentioned one line in my first book. It doesn't take place in the first book at all. And Leo mentions that's his hometown. I think that's it. Um, I'm working on the second or third draft of the second book. And my editor at the time said, well, you know, there's a real Endeavor, Wisconsin, right? I'm like, no, there's not. Just yeah, there is. And so it's on the way. So if you go north of, of Madison, it's about an hour and a half north. And we used to drive all the way up to Eagle River. And I'm sure I saw that sign somewhere along the way and thought, oh my gosh, that's a great name for a town. And then just kept it. Um, so anyway, I was worried. I couldn't change the name because it was already published in the first book. So my editor said, let's go there. Let's just check out the town, knowing that you know the village president was, was the villain in my book. So we did. Um, if you get a chance, I'll take you up there, Samantha, sometime. <laughs> it is, I've been all around the world. It is the creepiest little town I've ever oh. been in. It's just, it's hard to explain. Um, you drive, it's 450 people in this little town. My fictional town is, is a prosperous farming community, about 1,600 people. Um, this town is about 450. You drive and for miles around, it's very hilly, it's beautiful countryside. But at the very top, there's this big hill and on top of it, it's this factory that's broken windows, broken down factory. Um, and that's, you can see that above the whole town. So when we drove in, we went right to the top of that. And it was a sunny day, it was a Wednesday, like at noon, 1130, something like that. Um, we got to the top and there's um, weeds that are five feet tall coming out through the concrete. The windows are broken in. And I said, this is a Stephen King set right here. Above the whole town looks at this. So we wander way back down and we're driving through the little neighborhoods, their blocks. And there's this shrine in the middle of the neighborhood. It's 20, 16 to 20 feet tall. I mean, it's got pillars on either side where you can walk up the steps inside it. And I'm like, what is this? So we parked the car, we got out, we walked over and it was a mosaic, giant mosaic on the front. And it was a, we found a later shrine to Our Lady of Guadalupe because they had migrant workers that would come in and they, they developed this church and the shrine just for them. It's in people's backyards. It's very strange. So then we found out they did have a library. We went to their library, two librarians there, um, and just mentioned that I was writing this book and, and said, could I come back and do a book signing here? I think that would be fun. And she, they were excited. So when the book came out, we did. My daughter and I went up. Um, and there were 10 people, which is pretty decent for 40, 450 people yeah. and small towns. They brought all the food and they brought beer and everything else, you know, it was really fun. And so the, one of the first things I said, I did a little presentation and then answered questions. And one of the first things I said was, I want you to know that my endeavor is completely fictional. I mean, there is some, there is some things that I borrowed from it. Um, it, it looks the same in, in the environment as far as the beautiful hills and things like that. You know, there's some things that are same, but I said, as far as the people, completely fictional. And I want you to know this, I'm emphasizing this because my village president is the villain in my story. Well, as soon as I said that, they broke out laughing. They thought that was, I'm like, oh my God, don't you like your village president? And they, no, it's fine, it's fine. Well, the library is in the same building as the, as the village community hall or whatever, and they were having their meeting there. So about five minutes after I said that, the village president comes over and sits down to, you know, just to, you know, find out what's going on. And they started laughing again. <laughs> so then I explained to him 
why they were laughing. I just think, cause the, you know, my village president is, is a villain and, you know, and so then he just kind of nodded and then he laughed. Well, at the end of my little session and the questions, then we went over to get um, some food refreshments. And one of the women gave me a big hug and then she whispered in my ear, our village president is being indicted. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> So this little town has its own amazing stories involved, but every, I've been there now four, three or four times. Um, and every time I come home, I have to shower. It's just, I can't, I can't explain what it is, the broken down houses and the cars on the, it's just really, it's really sad. It's a sad little town. Yeah. Hopefully, as I said before, that nobody's from Endeavor. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, they were so sweet. The people were wonderful. What's that? Did they buy your book? They, oh, that was the other thing. So here's another thing when we talk about uh, real places. And I think that we can maybe talk a little bit more about this if you want to use real name of places. So of course, in this case I did. And how exciting for that little town to have some book that, yeah. So the 10 people, I sold 23 copies of the books. Yeah, oh. I know, I know. It was one of my best ever, yes. <laughs> That's fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> so when you do, if you're thinking about like a business that you want to use the name of, um, when I first was writing Carpe Diem Illinois, Leo worked at the Chicago Tribune, and I had Randy Richardson, who's the president of CWA, who was a journalist, look it over for me, and he said, you do not want to take on the Chicago Tribune in any way, shape, or form. So I changed the newspaper to the Chicago Examiner, which gives you enough of an idea of where it is he's working. Um, if it's a place, I do have names of real places, especially like in Madison and, and I mentioned in, in um, Chicago, if you're seeing the place in a good light, if something good happens there, then it's okay. What you might want to do is go to them and ask permission and explain why you're going to use them. Um, a lot of times they'll say, you know, be thrilled by that. And then the other thing is then you could have a book signing there um, and also have your books displayed there. Um, it's just kind of a nice, nice thing. If, however, people are being murdered, or in my case, my reporter um, starts out really being drunk and not getting his job done, you know, things that show the business in a bad light, then you need to definitely change the name. You don't want to mess with that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. That's for sure. Are there any other locations you've visited in doing your research? Um, so, yeah. Um, in the current series, um, the idea is called the devil particle. And the idea is that evil is a known quantity that can be collected and contained, collected from people and contained, but it has to be contained in one person. And it's a, a teenager. Um, so I wanted to know in the, in the beginning, what would this substance look like? What would it be scientifically? And so I met with my ex-brother-in-law who lives in Madison. He's got a PhD in chemistry and um, it, you know, knows everything about that kind of stuff, which is beyond me. And so I treated him to lunch and picked his brain. And that's how we came up with the title, the devil particle, as opposed to the God particle. Um, so, but he finally said, well, first of all, I said to him, so what, what would it be? Would it be electrical? Would it be chemical? What kind of a substance? He said, well, you're talking about evil here, right? Evil, evil. So if you have evil, if it's a substance that you can collect it, what, what would it possibly be? I know, I know. So I, would it be electrical? Would it be chemical? And he said to me, well, first of all, those are the same thing. And so I've, I've been the right place. I don't know anything about this. But he also said, you need to talk to a particle physicist, not, not me, somebody else. Um, so, and that's a good thing about talking to experts. They can lead you in the right direction if you're going astray. Um, I live in Madison. There's a lot of particle physicists here in town. But there is down in Illinois, in Batavia, is the Fermilab. Um, and I had never been there. I lived in Rockford and the whole time I never went down there. I thought, well, now's my chance. I have a good reason to go. And they used to have, and I'm hoping that they get that back again. The first, I think it's the first Sunday of every month. They have, um, it's an open free day. They give you a lecture and then there's a tour. And so my older daughter and I drove down to Batavia to, to check it out. And we get there and we're sitting at the tour first. Um, and there was a room of about, I would say at least maybe 50 people in the room and scattered in the audience 
were um, seven or eight um, re retired particle physicists. And they had these yellow, neon yellow t-shirts on so that you could you know, talk to them, ask them questions throughout the day. Um, so the lecture talked um, about math to some extent, and then I was pleased that I understood, you know, maybe about a third of that. I was really happy about that. Um, the rest of it kind of went over my head. But when he was done, he opened up to questions, and one woman raised her hand and she said, um, my son who's 12, and I think this was for 12 years up and older, because he was definitely there. Um, he wants to be a particle physicist. What should he study? I know. And the man said he needs to study all the math he can. He needs to be so far in advanced in math even before he starts to college that he's ready for college calculus. Um, so that's what I'd recommend. So she thanked him. And then one of the men, who, the volunteers with the yellow shirt raised his hand. And so the man called on him and he said, in a very nice British accent, he said, so I just want to add to that. Um, act I can't do British accent, otherwise I'll try. Um, I, I, I want to add to that. I just want to say he should study whatever it is he loves. Oh. So if it's music, he should study that. If it's math, study that. And so our philosophy, of course, of unschooling, that's exactly what we believe. And so Caitlin, my daughter, nudges me. She says, that's the guy, mom. Let's talk to him. <laughs> so, so we get done with the lecture. Our group, our tour group, started at the 16th floor. And if you've never been to the Fermi Lab, I have to recommend going. It's absolutely amazing. Um, they actually have buffalo on the grounds, which is kind of fun to see oh, in the middle really? of the line. Yeah. Um, and the tower is 16 stories up. Um, so we started at the top. We got off the elevator. And there was this man standing there by the window. So we made a beeline for him. And I went up to him and I explained my story about evil being collected, da, 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 da. and he slowly backed away from me. Like, <laughs> this is a crazy woman. What is? Well, this is one of the things I recommend. If you do talk to an expert, do your own research. Uh, know a little bit about the subject you're asking, or a lot, you know, especially if you're interested in it. And I'm interested in particle physics. Physics. My dad was major. My, my grandfather was a physics professor. So I, I have some of that in my blood, but I'm just fascinated by it. So I've done, I did a bit of reading before we went down there. And I started tell, explaining some things that I understood about the Fermi lab itself and then why I was there. And I, so then he started to warm up to me a little bit, he realized I wasn't completely off my rocker. And he took out a notepad and he's making notes and how this would go and everything else. He got all excited about it. Um, and we missed the tour and all of that. So then he came up to Rockford um, soon after we had our word of art um, in Rockford that we used to have every year. So he came up to that and now we're, we're pretty good friends. We get together every couple months. He lives down in Naperville. Um, but he then looked over my manuscript for me and helped me rig up a thing, you know, an extractor that would extract evil and, and how that would all look. And we came up with the, um, the name of them are agonistons, you know, antagonistic things. Oh. Yeah. And, and how it works. And it's, I think it, it, it works pretty well. Yeah. It works pretty that well. is so cool. It was fun. Yeah. It was really something. Yeah. Yeah. You no, know, how creative for, for a particle physicist to be able to create some device to extract evil. Right. I mean, that's so cool. Well, and so then he got, he's, re as I said, he's retired. And so he got the writing bug. Um, and he came up to Madison for right by the lake one one year with his daughter. And he's he's got a couple of ideas, several ideas for books. Uh, most of them are nonfiction, but like nonfiction picture books for kids to explain this stuff. And he does write uh, for Naperville. His name is Mike Albro, Dr. Mike Albro. He work, he writes for the Naperville monthly column for their social, I don't know what exactly what it's called, the newspaper down there um, online. And it's, you know, so he, it got him the bug too, and that that's possible, which is, fun. yeah. Very cool. You know, last time you had mentioned, um, you were doing research about police work. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember exactly who that was, but how did, tell, tell that story again. About yeah, that. so um, this, my second book in particular, that's, uh, that's more involved uh, with police there. And so I knew I, didn't know enough about police procedure other than what I watched on TV and read in some, you know, like Michael Connolly books and things like that. Um, 
So they have, and I hopefully they'll have it this year. Um, they have this thing called the Writers Police Academy. So I recommend if you're going to have any kind of police procedure at all in your books, check it out. Um, my daughters were excited about it too. So the three of us went to it. And that year it was in um, Appleton, Wisconsin, which isn't that far, two and a half hours, hour and a half, whatever, north of here. It's at their Fox Valley Technical School, which is training that's a police academy and firefighting academy right there on the campus. So all the equipment, everything's there. And it was a conference. You signed up, there was over 400 writers there. Um, and you could sign up for classes like how to fire a gun, how to handcuff, how to get your way through a burning building, um, riding in the fire truck and all kinds of, there's forensic psychologists there. And, Amazing. So we pretty, the three of us signed up for all different things so we could take notes. Um, I think we were in the handcuff class together because that was kind of fun. Um, we tried to get into the gun firing one, but that filled up immediately. That was hard to get into. So that was amazing. The biggest takeaway I had from that was that police procedure, even though it sounds, seems like it's the same everywhere, is extremely different, even in every county of Wisconsin itself. They have different procedures. So the county that the book got in Mayhem Street, my second book takes place in is in um, Marquette County, Wisconsin. So that's where Endeavor would be. So I knew I had to talk to the sheriff there um, and just kind of pick his brain. So I did, I emailed him and he was fine with that. And so I went up on a Friday and in the Marquette County, um, I think it's during the height of the summer, um, which is their tourist time, there's 16,000 people in the whole county. Um, so, you know, he had some time on his hands. I think Monday is probably busier, you know, people having partied all weekend, but Friday it was a little slow in the afternoon. So he was very happy to meet with me. Um, he was the perfect sheriff. I mean, he was just perfect. He must have been six, at least six, four, and I don't know, 250 or something. He was just, just big, big, you know, strong man. And I walked into his office. They had a nice big office. He had a, a conference table. We sat at the table. He was very slow and deliberate with his words, very patient. So we sat down and he, he had his arms in front of him and, and he said, so what brings you here? Little and lady. I said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I said, so I explained, and I'm not going to give it away, but I explained one of the last scenes in the book, um, had all this action and everything else. And I explained the scene and I wanted, I said, I want to know if this is accurate because people like you hopefully will read the book and I want to make sure that they aren't offended that I didn't do my research. And so I told him the whole scenario and he said, well, that's what would happen in Hollywood, but not in real life. So I'm like, this is why I'm here. So then I had to coach, totally rewrite the scene because it didn't make sense for real life. And I got all that information from him. Um, he was amazing. And so we were together about an hour and a half. And then behind, this is the new um, sheriff's the jail and everything else. Behind that, it was the old jail and still their historic jail. So he took me to give me a tour and it's haunted. And this big, you know, big burly man says, yeah, it's haunted. And I'm like, I said, no, no, I, my office was in here for, I don't know how many years, I forgot, many, many years. And I constantly heard George slamming and footsteps and everything else. And I was the only one in the building. And it was very, very creepy with, you know, with the jail cells and everything else, yeah. So that was really something. And then what was neat too, well, I think we talked about this. Hang on, I'm gonna get the book. Here it is. Um, on the way back from that, I knew what I wanted. I had um, self-published both of my first two books, and I knew what I wanted the cover to look like of God on Mayhem Street. I wanted to have this main drag of a small town. And so I took my camera and I drove down um, through Wisconsin from Marquette down to Madison. And so here's the, the picture. And um, I had said, people have to let me know where it is, but I'll just tell you, this is Lodi, Wisconsin, which is just 45 minutes north of me. And so I took the picture and my editor then took out, you know, any street signs and stuff like that. My publisher did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a good, a good trip all around. I got, you know, some really good information and then a good photo too. Right. Yeah. You know, my, um, my first book, um, it's a very long story for another time. Are you drinking water out of your beer bottle? It is water out of my bottle. <laughs> Um, 
So the story of my, my first book, I self-published after trying very many agents, getting a lot of rejection letters. But I decided to self-publish and um, I drove around Evanston, Illinois, a house figures very prominently in the story. And so I was looking for a house for the cover and I found the perfect house and it was it's on a street in Evanston. It's really beautiful. So I took some pictures and sent it off to my designer and the cover, eventually that book was picked up by one of the big five publishers, which is a inspirational story that I'll save for another time. And I like my original cover way better than the cover they put on the book. But anyway, the, the house was just perfect. And after the book was published, I knew the address, of course. So I sent a copy of the book to the people who lived in the house. And a friend of mine said, oh my God, why did you do that? They're gonna sue you. I'm like, sue me for what? <laughs> But it got me thinking, and but I had already sent it off. And then I got a letter from them, US mail letter, and thanking me for using their house on the cover of my book and saying, it looks more beautiful than it really is. And we're so pleased you used it and we love your book. So, you know, I didn't get sued and I got another fan, which was right. really fun. Right. And eventually I got published by yeah. one of the five. So <laughs> what's the title of the book, Samantha? The original? Yes. Oh, well, we don't need to go back to the original, but um, you so know, what's I can't... the title of the book for the sale? Title, the title of the book now, yes, yes, you're so good at this promoting stuff, <laughs> is what more could you wish for? Nice. And that one's published by St. Martin's Press. And it has a cupcake on the cover. I have the book with the candles, yeah. With the yeah. candles, which yeah. is so cute for a young adult book, but right. not for a story about a 50 year old woman. No. You know? Yeah. So I like, if I could put my original cover on the St. Martin's Press book, I would be so happy. Yeah. So there's two things about that. And the, the second thing, don't let me forget, I have two things um, I'll get to, which we didn't talk about the first time, but I'm going to add that. The first thing is my. So in my second book, um, my, my villain poisons cows. And I didn't know the best way to poison cows, having never done that and don't know that many cows. Um, so I actually met at a writer's conference, um, a veterinarian who was writing his books. And so I picked his brain. Yeah. And he, so he explained that to me. And then um, we had gotten touched many times since then and he actually reviewed the book for me the second book so that the farming information was accurate um terminology and everything else and so he um his name is um dr bill stork and his books are the first one is um in harriet's shadow and harriet is the h-e-r-r-i-o-t-t -T. Oh. you know the all the bless the beasts and children what the whole series that was big in the 70s or 80s or 90s yeah um, and it's because his stories, Dr. Stork's stories are about his life as a veterinarian and there's you know, snippets of that. So on the cover of his first book, the first one I just mentioned, he has this barn, um, beautiful barn. And he, unlike you, he asked the people first and they were clients of his, can I use your barn? And they were thrilled. So that's on the cover. And um, the amazing thing about that, not only was that you instantly have fans and people who are going to buy the book, but this family had 11 children who had a lot, you know, all they had children and they had grandchildren and on and on and on. So he instantly sold like 500 copies. Oh, <laughs> So that's something to keep in mind. If you can pick a cover. Yeah. That's yeah. Invaluable. Invaluable. Yeah. But the second point is um, so when I would go to do book signings and things at bookstores, um, my main character, Leo, um, I think he, and I shouldn't show you because you're not supposed Well, there. Okay. So my daughter drew a picture of him. That's what he oh. looks like. Um, in my mind, he's Rodrigo Santoro, who was in, he's a, the, 
top Brazilian actor and he was in Love Actually and he was in 300 and so he's not huge in America but he is like he's in Westworld so he's in some stuff oh. um, and so I would have this really cute thing about you know how this is my my character and I pull out his picture his photograph and show it to people and one of my um girlfriends who's more savvy on this than me said uh you need his permission if you're selling anything with his image on it <laughs> so it's some it's and they're like oh well right that's true I, I have to you know I have to ask that because if I'm going to make when I make millions on this book mm -hmm. I have to give some of that to him so and when it's turned into a movie then a movie, we'll start yeah. Well, but hopefully he'll star in it and then that'll be okay. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's just something to take into consideration. Um, I don't think those people in your house will come back and, you know, sue you for that, but it's always just good, especially your, it's, it is so cool for them to see that, you know, on the cover. Right. Yeah. Right, yeah. So, you know, it's all about connection and um, meeting people, talking to people and these resources that you're using, those are invaluable connections. Right. And who knows who they're going to tell? And, you know, right. which is the same. We talk about critique groups, and you and Tim had talked about that and how important they are. And, and all of us, um, unless we're teenagers um, and we're writers, all of us have these life experiences and all different kinds of backgrounds. So your critique group is a source of information. One of my critique partners has a small farm. So she was helping me in the beginning stages of the book with some, some things I should be looking into and researching more. Right. Um, so even those people, don't forget, they're not just writers. They've had lives, you know, and probably still do. Then they're a really great resource for a lot of things. That's true. In my current critique group, um, one of the books that I'm working on one of the characters is a psychologist. Well, one of the women in my critique group is a psychologist. So, you yeah. know, I've been picking her brain and that's really good. And also I have a friend whose um, daughter is a psychologist. And so some years ago, I tapped her brain for psychology lingo, you know, right. things that she would say that other people would not say. And I made a, an entire list of, of those things and it just makes your work authentic. It does, yeah. Well, in my books, the first two books and the one I'm working on now are teenagers. Um, so when I was writing the first book, my daughters were younger and they were in the teenage years. So of course I had them as my first go <laughs> resource. <laughs> I'd say, I don't even know what this means, mom, this phrase you're using, what does that even mean? So, but then um, for the current series, I actually um, talked to somebody, I think it was through CWA, who's a um, school teacher, high school teacher. And she invited me to come down to the high school and actually talk to them about the book and the process. So I gave them the manuscript ahead of time and have them review it for me. And so that was super helpful. Um, so it's not just experts like, you know, a part of a physicist or a veterinarian. It's, it's ordinary people in, that are maybe of a different background than yours, a different ethnicity or an age or anything like that. Um, they're all helpful. The, my, for some reason, my, most of my main characters are male. And I've never been male. Um, so as far as I know, <laughs> so it, it's helpful to have men, like I had like Randy look it over and a couple other men, just read it to see if it's authentic to men, um, yeah. things like that. It's really important to have a critique group and a beta group. And then of course an editor is important too, but all of that just to get you the feedback, make sure you're on the right page with these things. Right. Yeah. Right. So the bottom oh, line yeah. is write, write what you don't know. Write what you don't know. You just need to make it authentic. You need to talk to the right people to help you do that and, um, and do your research. Right. The main thing is, right, whatever you love and your imagination takes you, go for it, but do the research. Then honor it by making it um, you know, valid, making it truthful and true to form, all of those things. Yeah. Um, so make sure you do have it. I no noticed one in my drafts, if there's a part that it's kind of boring or it's just not moving, a lot of times it's because I was lazy and I didn't do the research. So I didn't get the details that were important. Uh, of course, they have to be important to the story, but that were important yeah. that made it realistic. Right. Um, so that's really something. 
But yeah. then on the other hand, like I, you know, hiked the Appalachian Trail and you did this other research, you're, you, you tend to want to go overboard with throwing that into the book because you spent all that time doing it and you, you're interested in it, but then you've got to make sure that it, it goes with the story, that it follows the story, that it moves the story along. So I did read this quote, which I think is really cute, but, and I'll read it again for this time. This is from, do, 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 do. Um, his name is Tom Young, How to Research a Novel, Seven Tips. Um, you can find it, it's through Writer's Digest online. So this is what he says about including too much information. You can leave some things out. If you do thorough research, you'll find more material than you need and no reader likes a data dump. In my own writing, I could bore you to death with the details of aircraft and weapons, but a very good creative writing professor once advised me to let the reader overhear the tech talk. Say if my character punches off a harm missile, that might sound authentic and pretty scary. But scary would turn to dull if I stop the action to tell you that HARM stands for High Speed Anti-Radiation Missile, which homes in on anti-aircraft missile radars. Who cares? The damn thing goes boom. <laughs> so it's something to keep in mind. And again, your critique group, your beta readers can say the pacing was slow at this point, or I put the book down, I wasn't interested. And that might be where you put too much information about the plants on the Appalachian Trail or whatever it is that you did the research on. Yeah. Right. And that's where a good editor comes in. And that's yeah. just, I am a evangelist for editing. And, you know, you need someone outside of yourself and your friends and family to look at your work and make sure that you haven't overdone it. You know, I don't know, have you ever read the book, The Martian? Maybe years ago. It was a movie oh, with that's the, Matt, yes, Damon. Yes, Matt Damon. Yes, yeah. yes, loved it. Well, it is so technical. Yeah. But to me, it was fascinating. Yeah. And I don't know, you know, it's one of those things that breaks all the rules. Someone might have told this author, and I can't remember who wrote the book, but yeah. you've got too much information in there. But I could not get enough of those details, and I'm not sure why. Well, so then that's a good book to go back and read again and study to see how he did it. Yeah. Because he does, it, it, it was, you couldn't put it down. And, right. and a lot of it went over my head. Some of the terminology didn't, but it, I didn't mind it. Now, on the other hand, Tom Clancy um, put so much stuff into his, and I have a hard time getting through his books. I think the movies are great, but the books... Now people are going to get mad at me because they like that stuff. And that's okay. Obviously he's got an audience for it. His books sell really well. And some of them are more technical than others. But yes, The Martian was really well done. So that's a good one to study if you want to include that higher end, you know, the, the more uh, technical you know, information in your story. Right. Yeah. Another yeah. one is um, The Queen's Gambit. Yeah. Which I saw the... Um, was it on HBO or one of the streaming services? And so then I read the book and it's, a, it's an old book. And he talks, it's so much about chess, all the details, all the moves, all the squares, everything. And again, I just found myself being fascinated by it. Yeah. And even if I didn't understand like K2 to R3 or whatever he, he was saying, it didn't matter. But I love those details. So those are two really good books to study. Right. Well, and it, you feel honored in a way as a reader when they've taken the time to give you that information. I mean, I really like books that are entertaining, but also that I learned something from them. Yes. And I feel like I'm actually experiencing it. So I haven't read the book, The Queen's Gamut yet, but I did watch the show and I, I do love to play chess. So it was interesting to see and to watch. And so now I'm really, is that a real move? And yeah, it was very, very authentic. The yeah. whole thing, right? Read the book. It's, I should not read it's, the book. Yeah, it's really yeah. good. Yeah. So we're coming up on an hour and okay. this has been so great. And I think we did a really good job of reproducing. I think we did, I'm looking through. Yeah, make sure we didn't miss something. Oh, I had, so last time we didn't get this covered and I think I'll just throw this in too. This is, um, Steps for interviewing an expert. So we've talked about how I've done that a couple of times. This is how to research your writing to ensure technical accuracy. 
This is by Dan Kolbolt. It's K-O-B-O-L-D-T. And so I'm just going to read what he says. He's got four steps to this. Okay. If you'd like to ask an expert for advice, here are some tips to make sure it's a pleasant experience for all parties involved. Do your homework. Get some thought to the technical subject in question and how it applies to your story before you start the conversation. I kind of mentioned that briefly. Yeah. Um, number two, briefly provide some context. In a few sentences, summarize your story and how the technical element comes into play. This will help the expert understand what you're looking for. Three, be considerate of their time. Experts don't exist for the sole purpose of answering writers' questions. <laughs> they should, but they don't. Don't? So don't monopolize their time. Keep your interaction polite, concise, and respectful. And recognize that you might need a different expert, which happened to me too. People who work in medicine, science, and other technical fields tend to specialize. You might find out in the course of the conversation that you need a different type of expert. So I think that's good advice. I remember somebody last time had asked if I pay experts right. um, for this, and I don't, I haven't. Um, I will take them out to lunch. And I always keep track of who I've talked to and who's given me help. And then I include them in my acknowledgements in my book. And I will send them a signed copy to thank them for that. Um, my acknowledgements um, aren't just a list of names. I like to have a little blurb about each person. Um, I don't know if anybody ever reads it, but when I look at acknowledgements, I, I find that insight kind of interesting and I like that in a book. So then I include that. Yeah, in my book. yeah. yeah. you know, there are so many helpful tips in those acknowledgements right. that people thank people for certain reasons. And it, yeah, those are those are really great. And then the people you're acknowledging are so thrilled to see their yeah, name. They are. Yeah. 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 Well, are there any stories we we missed before? Oh, endless finish? stories. We could go on forever, but we won't. <laughs> yeah. We'll do it over lunch. Okay, good. Yes. Yeah. And we can get together in person again. Yes. Yes. Sounds good to me. So I'm glad everyone is watching. And um, join us next month. We do cocktails and conversation on the first Sunday of every month. The next one will be April 4th with Nancy Johnson, who is the it girl these days with her new book, her debut novel, The Kindest Lie. So that will be really fun. And then in May, um, I'll have a publisher. So we'll have a chat with him. So Great. thank you so much, Kristen. You're just delightful. It's a Thanks, pleasure. Amanda. It was fun thank again. <laughs> it was fun again. It was fun to do it twice. Okay. Maybe we'll do it a third time. Right, right. <laughs> okay, well, thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.